Welcome back to the channel guys, and today let's talk about what a surprise! Betaflight! So the secret is, you open Betaflight configurator, connect with your flight controller, scroll a little bit down and click like and subscribe, and then save and reboot. So when is 4.3 official release? Why it is taking so long? What are the exciting features users don't see but they do exist? And what is awesome stuff is waiting for us in near future? Wait a second, but how do I know all that? Let me call my expert who knows why I know. Hello? Hello? Who this? Who the hell Lee Moan? I've been watching this here YouTube for like a couple videos now, and like this fool's just reading release notes and like telling them back to y'all like, Hello, I am Limon. I am the smartest here. Look at me. Listen to me talk. Ha ha ha. What the hell is that, man? Like, y'all like this? Before we start, let me thank these four Betaflight Flight developers because these four guys talked me through and explained a bunch of low-level stuff because, you know, I am a Betaflight mostly configurator developer and low-level stuff is just not my strongest side. So in this video, if I say something wrong, it is totally on me. But let's go! This video might end up being a little bit too long, so don't be shy and check this uh, fancy YouTube content menu. I hope most of you are aware that Betaflight 4.3 brings a lot of cool features like a new fancy dynamic notch filters, RPM filters crossfade, RC smoothing presets, but let's put all that aside. Because here we are trying to be nerds. And let's talk about Scheduler Scheduler Microchip on the flight controller has a lot of work to do. It needs to communicate with gyro, calculate your filters, calculate PIDs, communicate with ESC, record black box, update OSD, GPS, receiver, LED, MSP communications with like DJI HD0 and like actually many more tasks than that. And all that in this little micro flight controller which is like way weaker than even like your, your cell phone. Each one of these tasks has its own desired execution frequency. For example, a gyro reading task has to be executed every 125 microseconds, which means 8000 times per second. PID calculations could be the same or less frequent, depending on the user settings. OSD, for example, does not need to be updated more than 60 times per second, and actually less than that. If my voltage readings on OSD get an update, 4 times per second, I am good. Besides the desired execution frequency, every task has a duration. How many microseconds does it take to update OSD and during this time the microchip cannot do anything else. Every task has its own duration in microseconds, but that's not a big deal. The bigger problem is that this duration is not fixed and can vary. For example, OSD can take longer time or shorter time depending on what exactly you need to update right now. And there is a piece of Betaflight source code named Scheduler, which is in charge of figuring out which task to run right now when the previous task execution is over. And when the new task execution is over, it again needs to figure out which task to run next. And it all goes like this in a loop, basically an infinite loop, well in simple words. And obviously there are tasks way more time critical than the others. For example, if you're missing time to time your OSD frames, nothing bad gonna happen. But if you keep missing some of your gyro readings, then you're basically done. Pack your bags, you're going home. And the reason for that are filters. In order for them to work precisely, they need a steady, sampled, input data from the gyroscope. And this was one of the problems of Betaflight 4.2 and all the versions before that, that every eighth gyro reading was just missing, like duplicate from the previous one. How big of a deal is that? Every eighth gyro reading, just gone. Well, that was a combination of how the scheduler was implemented in 4.2 and the versions before, and also a weird MPU 6000 behavior, but now in 4.3 it is fixed. 
Another problem of the old scheduler is how it estimates the task duration. For example, OSD. It just takes the OSD task and tries to estimate how long it takes to execute OSD task just by taking average of some of the previous executions. And as we all know, average is not always a good estimation. It could be especially misleading in some cases if you try to guess what's gonna happen in future. For example, Mr. Peter got 10 6S batteries and he has 10 3S batteries. It means that his average battery is 4.5S. So what are the chances that random Peter's battery is 4.5S? Zero. Moreover, for 4S and 5S it is still zero. So there is always an average, but it's not always meaningful. So Betaflight 4.2 scheduler is doing sort of the same error with averaging the task duration. Hey OSD task, I'm the scheduler. I have 50 microseconds for you before I call for the gyro. Can you do that? Oh yeah, I am the fastest OSD task. My average is 30 microseconds. I'll be done even before you start being worried about me. Go ahead. But don't let me down again. <laughs> Low battery warning. Mm, artificial horizon. Pilot name. As a result, gyro, PID calculations, filter calculations, all are getting delayed and like missing frames. Don't take me wrong, I love Betaflight 4.2. I think it is absolutely amazing if you build your quad good, if you tune it a little bit, it's gonna be crazy good. But there's always room for improvement and that's why we're talking now about Betaflight 4.3. So what Mr. Steve has done in this case for Betaflight 4.3? Mr. Steve is a Betaflight developer who is in charge of all these changes around scheduler and he's a quite interesting person. He works in IT hardware as a big boss and yet he still finds time to contribute to open source. And he started that from OpenPilot. Do you remember this firmware from like 5-10 years ago? Then he moved to CleanFlight and now Betaflight. I think this is amazing. So a part of Steve's work during the last two years for Betaflight 4.3 was to go through the whole Betaflight source code through every task, well almost, and split every task into smaller pieces so that the scheduler could more precisely predict how long this or that task may take. It dramatically improves the chances of critical tasks running in time. Another change we have to thank Steve for is the change about DMA. DMA stands for Direct Memory Access. It's sort of a little engine inside of the processor that can transfer the data in parallel to the main calculations or other actions. By using this DMA, Steve was able to speed up multiple tasks such as gyro and black box. Gyro is a big deal, but black box is also a big deal. In Betaflight 4.2, the black box task was actually pretty slow. It means that behavior of your drone that you record with your black box could be actually pretty different from the behavior of the drone when you don't record black box. It's like the observer effect in physics that the act of observation of the experiment can change the outcome. And when you don't observe, then then well, then you don't know outcome. So in 4.2 it is still better to record black box, well then not record black box. But in 4.3 black box task is way faster, so it affects less on the outcome, on the drone behavior, which is pretty nice. I have to say that not all flight controllers can support all of the DMA changes and it depends on the flight controller design and decisions made by the manufacturer. If you want to know more about that, follow the link in the description to Betaflight 4.3 tuning notes. Now we are ready to answer the question, why Betaflight 4.3 release is taking that long? And why release candidate stage is taking that long? There are other big changes in Betaflight, but Steve's changes for scheduler and DMA are just massive. They touch pretty much everything in Betaflight code. And if you multiply that by the number of different flight controllers and peripherals supported by Betaflight, it will give you a rough estimation of how difficult was that to make all these changes without 
temporarily messing up something somewhere. Of course, developers and contributors are doing some testing, but there's only a few of us. And there are like some automatic unit tests that like cover something. But Betaflight is a project with community-driven testing. And if you check official Betaflight statistics during the last seven days, only last seven days, you can see that there are almost 10,000 Betaflight 4.3 users. This is a quite a big number and we guys really appreciate your job. But if you want to be a very responsible Betaflight tester, you need to join Betaflight Discord server. The link will be in the description. Go to Roll's channel and click this uh, first little icon for testers and it will give you a testers label on this server. After that, please follow the testers channel where developers share some essential testing and links that need to be done. So since December 24, 2021, since we started release candidate stage, there are several hundred of fixes for Betaflight repository from Steven and couple more developers. Some of these changes are pretty minor, like tuning of the new scheduler for particular hardware or settings. But sometimes it gets pretty complicated, for example, a special separate chapter express LRS SPI receiver, which did not work very nicely with the new scheduler. SPI receiver does not have its own microchip, so it's the Betaflight responsibility to communicate with SPI receiver and tell what to receive, when to receive, at which frequency and in which format. And because of the frequency hopping, receiver and your transmitter in the radio, they should change the frequency exactly at the same time. And if they don't change it at the same time, then they go out of sync and again, you, you're just going home, pack your bags. And I think by this time, for release candidate 4, 5 and 6, all of these problems with Express LRS SPI has been sorted. And this was a massive effort from Mr. Phobos, Alessandro, Jai, Visa, Express LRS developers, also of course Mr. Steve and Hydra, and a couple more developers that helped. A massive effort. To test all that, they were leaving Express LRS SPI communication like flight controller or radio, I don't even know, in the freezer overnight to make sure there are zero dropped frames and no freezes in the work during all of these hours. A close collaboration with Express LRS guys helped to reveal some of the failsafe problems actually inherited from Betaflight 4.2, and Mr. CTT Snooze actually did a massive rework on the failsafe behavior, and now I think starting from release candidate 6, it's pretty consistent no matter what receiver you're using, it just follows the procedure you set in the settings on failsafe tab or in CLI. But Mr. Citizen Snooze, Chris, he is a very unique guy. If he starts working on something, he never stops until it is perfect. After he finished with failsafe logic, he moved on to the GPS rescue. And basically, in a matter of like two or three weeks, now we have a completely different code for GPS rescue. He found a lot of problems in the 4.2 GPS rescue code. And now just look at that. You can see it coming in. Sort of above me. Okay, this is just kind of got a good line on landing spot. That's your idea. <laughs> just for your information, this is a return to home without compass, without barometer, with only GPS. Do you remember how Betaflight 4.2 GPS rescue worked? Yeah, now this is a completely different story. This new GPS rescue code hasn't been merged yet. And you can see the change is quite dramatic, but everyone is more than welcome to test it if he is brave enough. And remember, you just need to join uh, Betaflight Discord server and follow this tester's channel. You see there is a link right here to this pull request. And actually, there is a debate about this pull request, if it should be merged during the release candidate stage, or we should wait a little bit until we release official 4.3. Because this change brings a quite a dramatic safety improvement, but it also might be just too much for release candidate. And we've been waiting for 4.3 like too long enough. So, but anyway, you can always open this full request, check if it's still opened or merged. And you can always test it even before it is merged into the nightly build. But as of today, it is unknown yet if the world going to see 
this pull request in Betaflight 4.3 or we have to wait for the nightly builds after 4.3. But you can help with these pull requests right now if you just go ahead and test it. Just remember to read the pull request description carefully and follow it. And remember you do it on your own risk like we all do, so just please be careful. I also want to mention this pull request by Chris Schrosser. It is merged I think for uh, release candidate 4 or 5 and it is quite important for the guys running Bosch BMI gyros. You can see it is labeled as safety improvement because without this change the Bosch BMI gyro acting way different from the MPU 6000 gyro and it basically means that all the presets for MPU 6000 are quite dangerous for Bosch gyro, well depending on your build. But this change actually makes the Bosch gyro act similar to MPU 6000 gyro and I think this is quite important. There was a heated debate about this Bosch gyro pull request. Mr. Dusking and Mr. E-Tracer were saying that we are purposely and mistakenly making Bosch gyro perform worse than it can be because Bosch gyro by default should be a superior gyro over MPU 6000 and we are just making them equal. I was not 100% convinced, well, but what do I know, but I think it is pretty cool that now MPU 6000 and Bosch Gyro can perform pretty much equal, well, almost equal. And it means that if someone with uh, Bosch Gyro applies, let's say, a Karate preset or some like UAV Tech uh, Freestyle preset, they won't have a quad suddenly flies away because because this preset is made for MPU 6000 and they're flying Bosch gyro. So, so this is a truly a safety improvement. But if you still want to try the superior Bosch gyro in the superior mode, you just open preset stop and type uh, BMI and you see there is a preset from Dusking. Actually, there are two presets. One is like dual, dual Bosch gyro and this is a single. And you just, you just apply this preset right and uh, if you open it view online you will see what it does it actually sets gyro hardware lpf to option 2 and also some of the software filters as well and this will be like a superior bosch gyro mode that you can try and see if you like it i almost forgot to mention this sad bug with uh, icm 20689 gyro I think Joshua Bardwell and Blanty on one of their streams mentioned that, that RC6 4.3 might break this particular gyro from EventSense. If you don't know which gyro your flight controller has installed, you just open CLI and type status. And right here under gyro you see I have MPU 6000, so I am good, I am not affected by that bug because this bug is only about ICM20689. So here are some insights about what is happening with this bug. If you open the EventSense webpage about this gyro, you can see they are not recommending to use this gyro anymore for the new designs. And it's been like this at least from 2019, I think. The good news is that our favorite Mr. Steve is already in a close communication with TDK EventSense the manufacturers of this gyro about this issue. The funny thing that TDK were quite surprised that someone even using this type of gyro. But I guess in our crazy world days, like, we don't get to choose. As of today, there is no conclusion yet and there is no evidence that this is a problem of RC6. Moreover, it started looking like hardware problem with one of the batches of this gyro because most of the flight controllers with, with, with these gyros are not affected. So you kinda have to be lucky to catch this bug. There is a possible fix for this problem from Mr. Steve. And this fix was merged into Master after RC6. So you can find this fix in the latest nightly builds. So as I said, the work is in progress. Mr. Steve is in charge. TDK even sends our answering and this is, this is pretty cool. And also one of the flight controller distributors are helping with this problem, like providing their schematics and providing the faulty units and this is also very cool. If you want to follow the progress of this problem you can keep an eye on this pull request even though it has been merged already and you can keep an eye on Betaflight Discord server announcements channel.
Now, after the brief surface review of what is happening in beta flight, we are ready to answer the question when is the beta flight 4.3 official release? Huh? When do you think it is coming? I'm sorry, there is no magic answer. Nobody freaking knows. About four months ago I was pretty pessimistic and I would answer like never or like a year. But today I think it's just my personal estimation. It's gonna be one or two more months. It all depends on how many more bugs the community is going to find and also depends on how much time the developers will have to fix these bugs. So if you are embedded C, C++ developer and if you're willing to join an open source project, please join. We need some embedded developers, we need like JavaScript developers, like you all are welcome, more than welcome. Like Slack, Discord, uh, GitHub, issues, pull requests. Yeah, please join. This is the very fun way to waste your free time. But no, I'm telling you, like jokes aside, this is, this is fun. Now, you as a user, should you be worried about Betaflight 4.3? release date. I think absolutely not. You should not worry pretty much in any case. If you are type of a user that don't like to run nightly builds, don't like to run and mess with like release candidate, you want to run official releases, then as I said earlier, Betaflight 4.2 is absolutely rock solid. And moreover, when we release 4.3, it does not mean it will be bug free. Just there is no 100% guarantee there are no bugs. Because as I said earlier, again, Betaflight is a community-driven testing project. And in fact, if you check 4.2 releases, you see the last one is 4.2.11 in November 9, 2021 with some bug fixes. So even in November 2021, there were some bugs in Betaflight 4.2 and that's why we have Betaflight 4.2.11 and there was Betaflight 4.2.10, 4.2.9 and this does not mean that Betaflight is that bad, no. It's pretty much every project, like not even flight controller, like all, all the projects, they, they just work like this, like this is software, this is, this is modern world and like our um, hands like programmer hands that like growing from our asses you know like just we just called it like this like making bugs all the time now if you are type of a user that absolutely loves Betaflight 4.3 performance but you are so tired of updating configurator and updating your firmware now I can tell you you do not have to do that just stick with whatever works for you for example if release candidate 3 firmware works for you then just stick with it right and uh, you don't have to update your configurator unless something is not working for you and uh, for example configurator rc6 works perfectly with the firmware rc3 and vice versa like configurator rc3 works perfectly with the firmware rc6 you do not you do not have to like keep updating them and keep them in sync well unless like you face with some problems and well that's why we fix bugs sometimes but yeah the general idea you do not have to always update it just stick with whatever works for you if you are tired of updating important thing to say if you have configurator from 2021 then i'm sorry you have to update it also Betaflight Configurator 10.8 works good with Betaflight 4.2, but Configurator 10.7 does not work with Betaflight 4.3. Now, if you are a type of a user that likes to test and help with testing, but kind of like waiting for 4.3 release to finally stop this testing, well, I have bad news for you. Even when 4.3 is released, the project will keep moving and there will always be stuff to test. So really, no matter which type of user you are, the release date of Betaflight 4.3 should not bother you too much. Okay, see you in the next video, if I'm not lazy. Like and subscribe. No